Hello again. I wanted to follow up with my last video on heat and how we can deal with heat during racing pretty quickly because I had a number of questions on uh, what you can do to help prepare yourself for a hot race. Uh, one of my first races of the year every year has been Campeche for the last number of years. It will be this year again as well, as long as all goes according to plan the next month and a half. Uh, so this is something that I'm currently going through and making sure that I'm preparing my body uh, as best I can to uh, prepare in the heat uh, in the middle of a Mexico day, because for whatever reason, they thought it would be a great idea to start that race in the middle of the day. I don't get that one, but that's uh, not my call. So the adaptations that we're looking for are um, obviously the number one goal is to perform better. And when we go through this por uh, protocol that I'll talk about a little bit, uh, we're going to see an increase in blood volume. That's the first adaptation that typically happens. Uh, and you can tell that typically by an increase in body weight. And that's okay. Uh, gaining a little bit of water weight going into a hot race is actually a good thing because that gives you a little bit more of a sweat reserve to call on uh, and prevents obviously dehydration. Uh, other adaptations we're going to see are reduced heart rate at the same power or pace. Uh, hopefully we're going to see a reduced electrolyte co concentration in the sweat, so the amount of salt that we're losing as uh, per liter of sweat. Uh, that's something that most of us aren't going to measure Another topic I'll cover a little bit later on in a few videos uh, on that one specifically. Uh, we're also going to see uh, ourselves start to sweat quicker. So we'll start, uh, a lot of times we'll start uh, sweating just by thinking about the workout uh, rather than, you know, waiting 20 to 30 minutes into the warm up to start uh, sweating. We're also going to sweat a little bit more uh, as we go through that. But again, that's okay because uh, we have that increase in blood volume, which we're going to be pulling uh, from uh, the sweat out of. So uh, I'm going to post a couple of research articles in the link below here. And these are the two thing, two studies that I've kind of put together my protocol, the protocol that I follow. Uh, I've used this for a number of years. I've altered it and tweaked it based on some different experiences that I've had, uh, both with the prep and just the people I've talked to um, since I came across these studies the first time. Uh, the first study uh, that I'm going to talk about is PR. Uh, the, the one biggest takeaway out of his uh, article is it's basically a review of a number of different uh, uh, studies on heat acclimation. And the biggest takeaway is if at all possible, you want to simulate the conditions that you're going to have to race it. Uh, so if you can get to the, uh, you know, a similar environment, uh, heat, humidity that you're going to have to deal with on race day, that's ideal. I live in Storm Lake, Iowa right now. It's currently about five below zero. So prepping, you know, getting conditions uh, for that, it, it's just not going to be possible. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't go to race in Campeche. It just means that I have to be a little bit more mindful about the preparation that I'm doing. But if I can, could travel and do a heat camp, that would be ideal. It's not going to be in the cards this year. I actually haven't done an early season heat camp uh, since 2015, I believe, was the last time I did that. Um, all the travels I've done between there have just been to moderate um, climate. So uh, it's certainly possible to do this, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Um, the other study was by Shan, uh, Stanley, sorry, he showed a protocol basically uh, with trained cyclists and um, they basically sat in a sauna immediately after uh, about an hour to 90 minute workout for 10 consecutive days. Okay, and by doing that, they were able to get the adaptations that I mentioned earlier on. Obviously, as triathletes, that raises a few issues. Most of us aren't going to be working out for uh, um, 10 consecutive days as uh, you know hard enough uh, to get the core temperature uh, up enough and maintain it for at least 90 minutes. The general rule of thumb is your core temperature needs to stay elevated for 90 minutes. And 
the the takeaway from the Stanley study shouldn't be that you need to alter your schedule and drill yourself into the ground for 90 minutes for 10 days straight. Um, that's really not the the best way to go about it at all. Uh, I don't think you know two three weeks leading into a race that's going to set you up uh, best for race day. And so we can still use the concepts and the general uh, takeaways from this study and fit it into a protocol that makes a little bit more sense for a triathlete who's swim, bike, and running. Uh, so, you know, you can't get your core temperature up in most situations swimming, you know, if the water is 90 degrees or if you're using a wetsuit in 80 degree water, maybe. I'm not recommending that. It's not the safest thing to do at all in a pool, um, but you could possibly get your core temperature up, but you just don't have to. Uh, you can go to the bike uh, or run on the treadmill if you're in a situation like me where you're primarily uh, going to be doing these the heat acclimation workouts indoors. Um, and use that those tools uh, to help prep yourself here. Uh, so a couple of years back, I went and did some testing in a heat lab. And after the tests, I was able to just go back and forth with the people that were actually administering the tests there and just have a good dialogue with uh, what they're seeing and what um, what they would recommend uh, for athletes such as myself, or maybe even an age group athlete who isn't working out, uh, you know, doing a swim, bike, and run in 10 consecutive days. Um, so basically what they suggested is to, you know, use the same general principles that in the study that I talked about before, but if you do uh, four to five days of heat prep in a seven day period, so four to five days a week, and then continue that for two to three weeks, you'll get to the same level of adaptation that the um, cyclists did in the Stanley study in 10 consecutive days. All right, so what that means is if in four to five days per week, if you can get and maintain an elevated core temperature enough for at least 75 to 90 minutes, then you can still get those heat uh, adaptations. The nice thing is, is after you have that, after you have that heat acclimation in place, it doesn't really take that much to maintain it. One to two times per week from then on will maintain those adaptations. So the effort is getting it. And, and that also gives you a little bit of leeway so you can do it a little bit earlier on in the build and still get the quality workouts that you want to do the last couple of weeks leading into the, the high priority race for you, right? Because when you're doing this heat acclimation, uh, it's gonna take a lot of energy out of you and your, your workouts might actually suffer a little bit, your recovery, recovery is gonna suffer a little bit. And so you just have to be mindful of that. And so doing this a little bit earlier in the build and then just doing one to two sessions per week afterwards uh, is going to be more than, um, effective uh, in maintaining those adaptations that we're going for. Okay, so I've mentioned, you know, four to five days for two to three weeks. That's great. Um, my goal is typically 15 sessions. And the way that I do that is I find a 60 to 90 minute workout, either bike or run that I'm going to do on the trainer. And then uh, I go immediately into the sauna right afterwards right and i'll sit there for about 30 minutes and the goal is to make it so i can sit there for 30 minutes straight as i'm just starting this whole protocol maybe i'll only make it 10 minutes and then need to take a little break so i'll go out get out of the room or out of the sauna for a couple minutes and get back in just so i get you know 30 minutes total combined and as i go i try to make it longer and longer and longer and by the last five sessions, I want to be able to sit there uh, for about, you know, for 30 minutes straight through. Um, it's perfectly okay to bring fluids into the sauna with you. That actually might help increase your sweat rate a little bit. Uh, and it's going to help 
uh, improve the recovery afterwards. You don't want to bring cold water and then dump it all over yourself. That kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, but drinking water or drinking, you know, take I typically take uh, a bottle of Ultrogen, uh, my first endurance Ultrogen uh, in with me. That's what I have for recovery. So I'll have it sitting down there right next to the sauna. As soon as I finish the workout, I'll bring that in with me uh, and I can actually start the nutri uh, recovery on the nutrition side as I'm finishing up uh, the heat adaptation. Um, again, you, you need to maintain that elevated core temperature for about 90 minutes. So that means you can't just kind of spin the pedals or run easy uh, for 60 minutes, sit in the sauna for 90 minutes. It has to be a relatively high intensity workout and you need to um, be getting into the high intensity blocks early on if it's only 60 minutes especially. If it's 90 minutes on, uh, in the workout, you can build into it a little bit more. Uh, getting into the sauna as soon as you can after your session finish finishes is the best way to go. You don't want to cool down completely. I typically skip the cool down session, um, get onto the sauna or get into the sauna as quickly as I can. And then if I'm feeling a little bit tight, I might go back and uh, cool down on the bike uh, or do some light jogging or Typically, I just bundle up and take the dog for a walk uh, as part of the cool down after the sauna session. Um, some research has suggested that greater adaptation occurs if you do not consume fluids during the workout, but you can consume fluids while in the sauna. Okay, it's really important here as you're getting into the sauna um, protocol that you're paying attention to your hydration levels. Uh, that means monitoring your urine color, weighing in before the workout, and then after the sauna session. And you wanna consume about 150% uh, of the fluids that you lost or the total weight that you lost. So if you lose, uh, if you lose four pounds during your workout and your sauna session, you wanna drink a total of six pounds within the next two to three hours, uh, or maybe even up to four hours after uh, the workout. That way you're trying to stay on top of it. I've mentioned the sauna. That's a great tool. Obviously not everybody has a sauna. A steam room will do the trick as well. I don't have that available to me, so that's why I use a sauna. Uh, if, if it's a good steam room, that'll be no problem. Obviously it's really humid in there as well, so that can help you know, maybe even be better for some of the higher humidity races that you're prepping for. A warm bath might work. Uh, the key with the warm bath is to, you need to submerge your, as much as yourself as you can. Now, I'm not saying you should be like breathing through a straw or anything crazy like that. Uh, you know, the swim snorkel works just fine. I'm kidding, you don't need to do that. Uh, but you know, you don't wanna sit with just like your waist out of the water. You wanna try to get your uh, core and your torso uh, submerged as much as you can. Overdressing for workouts has been shown to give uh, some, some benefits. Um, it just hasn't shown to be as effective as doing the actual workout at the prescribed intensity and then hopping in uh, to a sauna steam bath or regular bath forever. Uh, or, sorry, regular bath immediately after. Uh, personally, I might start off overdressed to get my core temperature up. And then once the interval starts, I'm going to typically go down to what I would normally wear because I want to be working out to get faster, not just to be hot typically. Um, so uh, I, I don't want my workout to suffer so much the, because I'm dressed too much. Plus it brings me back to uh, my wrestling days uh, and cutting weight and all those uh, lovely times. So uh, I've, I've had my fun with that. So I typically try to uh, just be dressed normally during the workout and then um, maintain that core temperature for longer afterwards. Finally, it's important to use your brain and listen to your body when doing any heat acclimation protocol. Never push to the point where you start to feel faint or start to pass out. No, I'm not just saying this so you don't sue me, but please don't. Uh, but uh, you can easily overdo things if you're too aggressive too fast with this approach. So just ease into it, be smart, listen to your body, uh, and yeah, I hope this helps. Any questions, leave them in the comment section below.